Good morning, folks. Good morning. Thank you. Sunday first thing. Hope you're enjoying. Ooh. Yeah. Hope you're enjoying a, a lovely Father's Day today. Let me read to you from Proverbs 23, verse 24. The father of a righteous child has great joy. A man who fathers a wise son rejoices in him. Just something for all you fathers to repeat back to your children this morning when they shower you with gifts and love and, and time. Just, just nod, just nod here, yeah, just nod. Excellent. Well, uh, let me welcome you to Living Room Church. My name's Gordon. Uh, it's lovely to see you all out this morning. It's, it's lovely to see Little Aiden with us this morning. It's lovely to see Karen. So welcome to you too. Um, we're going to start uh, in a moment by, by singing, but before we do, let's, let's commit our service to God in prayer. Almighty Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to stop, to step away from our duties and responsibilities in the world, to, to spend some time looking to you, thinking about your word, Lord, and asking you to encourage us, to bless us, to teach us, to show us what we should do and how we should do it. We pray, Father, that as we meet this morning, that you would warm our hearts and fellowship, but also that you would instruct us and you would prepare us for the things that you have called us to do. Amen. 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 Let's, uh, let's stand and sing together. Behold our God. Oh, 
this morning. Um, There's a little bit of a confusion. Somebody forgot to turn up to do sound this morning. But he's, he's crying about Scotland's loss in Germany, so <laughs> never, never mind. Yes, yes, a very big announcement. On Tuesday night this week, uh, we will be having our annual general meeting as a fellowship. It will be at 7.30. It will be in the living room. And I'm going to encourage all members to attend. Uh, if you're not a member, but you'd still like to see what goes on, you're very welcome. Uh, so please do mark your calendars. Preferably now, if you get your phones out, I won't mind. Tuesday night in the living room. Okay, I think we've covered that. Oh, good. Yeah, for all members, Tuesday night in the living room, 7.30. Muy bien. <laughs> right, um, okay. I don't think I've forgotten anything else. Anybody? Remember anything else that's supposed to be mentioned this week? No, good. Okay, right. Let's uh, let's sing again uh, before the before the children go off to their their meetings. Uh, let's stand and sing. Uh, Every giant will fall. <laughs> Shadows feel the light 
service, so please do continue those conversations. Don't let them go. Okay, let's um, let's set our hearts now and um, just spend a bit of time praying before we uh, think about the sermon. Let's pray. Almighty Heavenly Father, we submit to you. Lord, we trust you, we love you, and we ask for your mercy upon this world that we live in. Father, there's so much that troubles our hearts that we have no influence over and no control over, but we know that you are in control, Lord, and that you are the God who loves us and cares for all of us. We pray, Father, for our world and the, the many wars that are going on at the moment, the many 
trials that are facing your people in different places, facing persecution uh, and fear of uh, punishment and execution for standing up for Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to send out your missionaries. We pray, Lord, for the hearts of those in all countries, but particularly those that are troubled by war and strife, that they would continue to proclaim your name boldly and faithfully. We pray, Father, for your mercy upon the vulnerable who are caught up in the, the conflicts in, in Gaza and in Ukraine particularly. We ask, Lord, for a turning of hearts and minds, that you would take the hearts of those leaders who are against peace and that you would change them, Lord, that you would turn them to peace for the sake of their own people and others. We pray, Father, that you would be present. We pray for our own country, Lord, as it... Uh, is in a time of uh, tumult, a time of turmoil. We pray, Father, for the upcoming election in July. We pray that your will would be done. We ask, Lord, for a, a government that would be mindful of you, that would remember the Creator. We pray for our leaders, Lord, that you would put in place uh, both men and women who are able, who can care for the people, but we pray, Lord, for an environment in which we can continue to preach and uplift the name of Jesus in this country. We pray, Lord, for the opportunity to provide people with your remedy for their problems, your remedy for their disasters in their lives, Father, because only Jesus, only Jesus can save. Father, we pray for our own community, for Wallaford and East Lothian. We pray for the witness here that you would Provide us with opportunities to speak to our friends, our families, our, our work colleagues, the other communities that we're a part of. We pray, Lord, for uh, the ongoing application for a, a place to, to worship for ourselves. We pray that your will would be done. We pray, Father, that you would teach us, that you would help us to wait while your timing unfolds, because we know your timing is perfect, Lord, and we know that you want good things for this community and that you want to bless us with the means to do the job that is in front of us. And finally, Lord, we, we pray for those who have been troubled with illness. We pray that you would have your hand of blessing, particularly upon Rosie, and that you would bless the family and with strength and patience to, to go through this trial. And we ask, Father, that you would bless the, the work that's going on now with the children. Uh, next door and, and over the road, that you would enable them to see with open eyes through your spirit how lovely the Lord Jesus is. Father, we pray for your glory to be seen in this place. Amen. 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 Okay, we'll sing once more before Andrew comes to speak to us. Let's uh, stand and sing uh, My Living Hope. <laughs> Yeah. 
closer to the end in the book of Revelation. Um, we're almost in the end game part. We're so close. We've had the bold judgment. We've heard the exclamation that says, it is done. But now we, then we had a chapter last week and it was all about a harlot um, who rides in the back of a beast. And this character that we're introduced to in chapter 17, which we understand, of course, the Bible says is Babylon is likely the constant reinvention of the seductive offerings of systems devoted to luxury and godlessness and a persecution of God's people. So we are going to begin in chapter 18 um, and verse 5, actually. If we can just flick this up, verse 5. If you could find that for me, please. Verse 5. Um, no, verse 4, sorry. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. That's where we're starting today. We've heard about Babylon, but we need to know that Babylon is not a good thing. Babylon is about to be judged in this chapter. And we need to know what we need to do with Babylon in our own situations right now. Come out of her. And we're going to think about how we do that. Um, but basically it means avoid participation. Um, 
I was speaking to Jeannie. Um, I was visiting Jeannie just a couple of weeks ago, and she described this world's temptations like a web, a web that too many people get trapped in. And I just think that's a terrific way of looking at what, we'll be, what we're thinking about today with the harlot. It's very hard to spot a web when you're flying around at a million miles an hour like a fly or a wasp, but it's sticky and it's deadly. And that's why it's such a good thought for us as we move into what we're going to look at today. So just if you can flick right back to the very beginning, just a few things. Come out of Babylon. That's our very first call. Um, but also there are those who are going to wail and there are go those who are going to rejoice. I wonder where you will be as you listen today and think about some of the things that we're going to be looking at um, as we see the fall of Babylon and the fall of that harlot. So what does it look like? What does the harlot look like that we're trying not to get caught up in? Well, we've thought about how it's systems, about luxury, and as we move on into chapter 18, we're going to find out about the people who are affected. And actually, as we see their reaction, we probably are going to be able to know, as we see those who mourn her demise, what the seductions are that we need to avoid. So let's look at our first eight verses um, in Revelation chapter 18. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. And that's a, um, that's a, a quotation, by the way. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. We need to read on, actually, don't we? Yes. I heard another voice from, say, from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in, the, in her plagues. For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back, as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I sit as queen. I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. Some stark verses, I'm sure you'll agree, and uh, to read once again, wake up, it's Sunday morning, and uh, we love to start with a bang here in the living room, don't we, in the book of Revelation? But you'll notice a few things, if you can just go back to that first verse, thank you, Graham, that angel who speaks. The angel is obviously another powerful one. When we get these angels who are doing these incredible things, they're always really powerful, aren't they? And we're beginning to think that probably all angels seem to be really powerful. But this one lights up the world with them, with the glory of his brightness. And we know from previous experience that when a, an angel comes along to share something, it's going to be really important. Um, and it's even reflected in this angel's mighty voice. Now, what the angel says... We might remember, I certainly did when um, I've been preaching through this. You might forget a lot of things that I preach, but I did remember preaching about this one. It was chapter 21 in Isaiah, where we talked, and we've been looking at lots of symbolism, but we talked about the literal city of Babylon. Um, and if you were to go to Babylon now, I know I said this last week, but if you were to go to Babylon now, it's nothing but ruins. And that's nothing but, you know, some little wild animals of the desert that run around it, if you were to go there right now. It is a place of wild animals. But of course, as we've seen here in the book of Revelation, it's also speaking about a model for kingdoms opposed to God, that the nations and kings of the earth have committed adultery, adultery with her, and that the merchants of the earth have grown, have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living, suggests, suggests that Babylon didn't disappear when it became a ruin thousands of years ago. 
okay, when it fell to the Medo-Persian Empire and then began to decline after that. And that her destruction back then in Daniel's time wasn't the end. It would seem like a pretty petty grudge to hold. If it's already been dealt with one and a half thousand years ago, and yet um, this grudge seems to be still held against Babylon right to the end of the Bible. Unless Babylon is more than just the literal city. What we find, of course, is that Babylon is a code word, just to remind you of last week, that Christians at the time would have known from chapter 17 that the seven hills spoke about Rome. Rome was their centre now. And the immorality, which of course we also discussed last week, isn't just sexual immorality, although it does include that, but it's a spiritual immorality because idolatry, which we looked at when we saw um, the book of 1 Corinthians, where idolatry is a major issue and sexual immorality always went along with idolatry. Babylon had influenced the people over the years to turn away from God, to reject the God of Abraham and Isaac, and as it had done so, it had gained wealth and power in return. And the sins of Babylon were her rejection of God, if you remember that in chapter 17, and her slaughtering of God's people. So the literal city of Babylon, and that was in huge danger of slaughtering God's people. And of course, Rome, that was doing that so beautifully in the Colosseums and lighting up colonnades with Christians on fire. All of these sins are too many to miss, far too many to miss. And that's why we get this expression about how they're like piled up to heaven, a huge amount. God has seen it all. It's not that, well, only now that it's getting up here do I notice it. No, they are piled high from the bottom to the top. God sees it all, and so Babylon must be judged and we get that language of the expression of payback. Um, now, there could be confusion over that phrase because it says repay her double, which doesn't seem very fair because we would have thought that God would be just. Um, but this expression might well um, go in verse 6. You might look at verse 6 and see that it's, it's a like-for-like like measure. And then verse 7, um, of this measure of torment um, is, is appropriate for her. We probably need to understand that what, what's being told here is that she's going to get what she deserves. A full measure of judgment, not a half one. And not just because it has pulled people away from God, but because Babylon has glorified herself. Do you see the language of glory there? I am no widow, I sit as a queen. Glorifying herself instead of God. Feeling that she's been unable to be punished in any way. She's untouchable. Well, in verse 8, the judgment is swift. The judgment is sudden. And before we move on, we, of course, right at the very beginning of the book of Revelation, we were thinking about the churches, the seven churches. And one of those churches, Pergamon, was the church that had compromised with culture they would have recognized that they had failed to stay away from Babylon, as they would have read this part of the book of Revelation or heard it being preached to them. And even though they had a call to repent, they would have known this reminder, even towards the end of the book, to stay away from the influence of Rome, no matter about the social status that it might have brought them or eating the foods that were sacrificed to the idols and the sexual immorality that went along with it. Remember the church in Pergamon. Go and have a look at that when you get home as well. Babylon is judged. So let's read on and find out about the people who are affected by it. So there are three groups of people that we're going to read about. Um, those who wail. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning, they will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. 
And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn for her, since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and slaves, that is, human souls. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you. And all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud, alas, Alas for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls, for in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste. And the last group, and the shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose trade is on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and they wept, as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas for the great city, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven. Oh, we're going to get to verse 20 in a moment, actually. Let's finish at verse 19. Who is affected by Babylon's fall? Three categories of people, starting in verse 9 with the kings. Uh, thank you, Graham. Well ahead of me. The language, of course, used for sexual immorality with is probably maybe a little bit more like in our modern English language. I think this is really helpful. We're in bed with. And we know that that doesn't necessarily literally mean um, in bed with, but actually means in association with, enjoying what went with the lifestyle of forgetting God of the universe and enjoying the luxurious lifestyle that has gone along with that. These people have sided with Babylon, these kings, these influential people have sided with Babylon. So when Babylon falls, you can imagine that's going to be hard for them, isn't it? They weep and they wail after the speedy fall. Their lifestyle is gone. The decadent, I'm trying to find all the superlatives I can find, the decadent and pleasure-filled life that they have enjoyed with Babylon is gone and they can't believe their eyes. It seems, seems so secure. It seems so invincible. They were totally tied up with Babylon. And now they distance themselves from it. I go online to try to find a picture that I hope summarizes the chapter that we're looking at. And this is the one that I got when I was looking around. I thought it was quite a, quite a clever one. These have been people of power, people of authority. They've lived their life for their own self glorification and gratification and they themselves have thought that they would be invincible a bit like Babylon and now they stand in horror because they fear their own demise too this is probably what's going to happen to them they've enjoyed the power and the perks and of course this doesn't mean every person of power and every person who's a king or a queen um, but the common thread of luxury can lead to compromise and it can lead to lack of dependence upon God. It's where it can lead. And so in seven, 11 to 7, the first half of verse 17, we find those merchants, and they also weep and mourn, of course, because she's given them a good standard of living too. They've benefited. Their income stream is now gone. But they're not just any merchants. And so you see this list. What an incredible list. It starts off with such opulence, doesn't it? Precious metals, stones, cloths that are expensive, especially handcrafted items of wood, metal and stone. And then a list of spices that still seems very nice and wonderful. Then down to the food sources, items of wood and metal and stone, um, or uh, food sources. And then at the end of that list, what do we have? Weapons of war. People who've made money out of weapons of war. My goodness, is that a hot topic at the moment? 
and all of the expensive pay of people. The poor little ones who are right at the bottom. The slaves, the trafficked ones, the chattel. What an absolute disgrace. Money made off the backs of the poor. All about the money. Anything that has helped them to get rich in that way has been fair game. How awful to see human trafficking and slavery as the worst of those crimes. Now, of course, this isn't a passage against everybody who runs a business. And if you run a business here, bless you so much. Um, or is in a trade of some sort. I don't think we've any merchant bankers here at the church. I don't think we've got anybody here. Um, but this does help us examine our materialistic pursuits at the expense of God in our lives. Of course it has to. We live in one of the richest countries in the world. And the rich often act unjustly, pay minimally, oppress, enslave. And we know all too well that human trafficking is probably worse now than it ever has been in the history of this world. And we have people who defraud others and mistreat workers. How many of us have worked for people, managers, who just are rubbish? at working with people under them. People who work harder for their shareholders than, than their employees. Gosh, that just feels like common news every day, doesn't it? Because they enjoy the fruit, as it says in verse 14, the fruit of their labours, the money, the, the opulence. They've been more interested in the perks than doing what is right. They're Delicacies, delicacies of trade under Babylon then disappear. They're gone forever as Babylon is judged again, mourning their own personal loss. Do you notice that? Trying to distance themselves from Babylon again, standing far off and crying, fearing they might come to the same end, which they will. And of course, we skip that. This, they weep for themselves. Verse 11. Look at that verse 11. No one's going to buy from them anymore. And they feel sorry for themselves. Their revenue channel is gone. And then, of course, we move on to the last group of people, the seafaring people, verses 17, the second half of 17 to 19. Help us see what happens to the import and export folks, those who carried and shipped all these expensive wares around the empires. And their exclamation sums up what all the people cry as Babylon falls. It's been all about economics. Money, the love of money that has meant so much to them. The life that they have been able to lead that has mattered far more than anything else. So the question comes back to us, do we have a healthy relationship with money? Is it our God? Do we have in our minds, as we live in our own form of Babylon, systems and controls, that we don't have to live by its standards? Even though we might have Babylon's delicacies and luxuries at our fingertips, we can order something on our phone right now if we wanted to. Advertise to us all the time. Have we been seduced by lifestyles, images, we care much more about looks and possessions and entertainment and travel and fame and fortune than God, who stands over and above it all and deserves the proper praise and worship than anything the harlot Babylon can offer. We're going to come back to that thought. Um, let's read our last verses for this morning. Let's read 18 verse 20. Actually, can you go back? Because I've um, copied and pasted the wrong one in. Rejoice. So this is a new bunch of people who are being spoken to here. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. And let's read on. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. 
and the craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more, and the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more, and the light of a lamp will shine in you no more, and the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more, for your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on earth. And then into chapter 19. After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Those are quite some verses, and they have a lot to say to us. In those previous verses, we had three alas for the city. Now we've got three hallelujah. That city is gone. Three praise statements to express rejoicing as a contrast to the sadnesses of the last verses. For in, for in these verses, we have a call. We should be celebrating that that will come to an end. Now, I'm going to read you a list. And you might think, I'm not sure if I would be that happy to see the end of all these things. No more concerts. No more theatre, cinema. No more football matches. Craftsmanship, smiths, makers, Etsy, building, industry, food production, weddings, commerce. <coughs> the city that is silenced. Now listen, when we think about this city, we were, we were talking with some home group actually, I'm not going to mention who it was that was saying, but it was just saying, but I hope I get to make things in heaven. I hope we get to do things in heaven. Do you know, I can't tell you whether that's a yes or no answer, but if you do, it won't be for your glory. And I think that that's when we see that list of all those things, it's always been about them. Look at me, how great I am. All the concerts, come and worship me. Come and watch me play football, basketball, whatever it is, the sport that you like to do. Come and watch how great I am. Come and, wa come and worship me. Come and follow me on Instagram and X. Make me money. All gone. All transformed. How wonderful that it won't be about people anymore and worshiping people anymore and that decadent lifestyle because it'll be about worshiping God. That'll be the best thing about it. Before we begin to mourn ourselves, it's what's been behind our earthly form of music and industry and craftsmanship, it's sorcery and bloodshed, opposition to God and to his people in the elevation of self. That's what's been behind it all here. So the silencing of the city is the silencing of all that stands against God, pulls us away from God. How wonderful that will be. You know, that's something I can really say hallelujah to because I love concerts. I'm playing one next week. I want people to come and see the concert. But how wonderful that things that pull us away from God will be all gone. Babylon is harmful to this world and to people. So judging Babylon is the right thing to do. So it comes back to us. We live in our own form of Babylon right now. 
and we can't leave it, okay? You know, much as I might see that, there's an island in Shetland Islands for half a million pounds, and I keep thinking, wouldn't it be great to just go and live there and get away from all of this? Daniel didn't leave Babylon, did he? Daniel um, chose to honour God in the middle of Babylon. Even when it was against the law, he still chose to worship God in Babylon. And he rose to power, but only when he acknowledged God's right and God's power over all the world. Joseph couldn't leave his own version of Babylon, could he? Yet he chose to honour God in the pagan culture and do his best to live for God over all. Jeremiah, uh, communicating what God himself says, um, tells the exiles in Babylon, by the way, um, communicating what God says, seek the welfare of the city. And that's in chapter 29, if you're taking notes. So do you see what the difference is? Because the city is all about seeking its own welfare and standing out above everybody else as being better. That's what the city's about. But we're to seek others' welfare. We're to work for God's name and his glory. Because we have a lifetime struggle ahead of us. <laughs> Job's comforter come to speak to us all this morning. We have a lifetime of struggle ahead of us to live as Christians in Babylon. Where, by the way, as the statistics have come out after the census, we have now found out that we are living in a country where there are more people of no faith than there are of faith. 51.1% of people who signed the census in Scotland said they're of no faith. We're in Babylon. So how are we to obey what verse 4 said and come out of Babylon? Lest we take part in her sins and share in her plagues. Well, maybe for the younger person, uh, I've got to admit I, I'm not in that bracket anymore. But for the younger person, that might look very different from what it means to me. If you're controlled by social media, <coughs> online shopping, YouTube and TikTok and Instagram videos, gaming, image, sport, you are being seduced into Babylon's way of thinking. So what are you gonna to do to come out? You're gonna to have to set limits. You're going to have to set limits and you're going to have to pray for one another. And that goes for all of us, by the way. You need to be in a small group of people. You need to actually have people come alongside you and pray with you and for you. You can't do it by yourself. And coming here on a Sunday morning isn't enough, I'm afraid. We need to keep reminding ourselves during the week. Small groups are a perfect place to stay sharp and make sure that you're not being drawn into Babylon. We're keeping your priorities, God's priorities. And we're to hold fast to him. We're to stay awake, remember. We're to make sure that we don't compromise. Remember those letters to the churches. So no matter whether you're in school or university or college or the office or a workplace or a village or a town, make sure that people know that you're a Christian. And meet up with other Christians, maybe in your workplace. Maybe in your school, maybe in your university, and stay focused on Jesus. That's how you stay distinct, separate from Babylon, and to come out rather than being seduced. And for those of us who are older, and I count myself here, by the way, our jobs, our financial security, our possessions, our pensions can attach us far too strongly to Babylon. If we're more interested in a comfortable lifestyle than reading about the end of Babylon, then we're in danger. We've been seduced. Chapter 19, with that multitude of people crying out, hallelujah, we should be, we should be joining that. And saying, great, I can't wait until it comes to an end. Because salvation and glory 
and the real power belong to God, not to our stuff. Knowing that the blood of our brothers and Jesus, our, 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 the blood of our brothers and sisters around the world will be avenged one day by the one whose judgments are true and just should cause us to say, praise the Lord when Babylon finally comes down and people are not taken advantage of and enslaved anymore. We must stay focused on what gives ultimate joy. And maybe you're here and you don't know if you're a Christian or not. You, you, you kind of like maybe dancing around the Christian thing. Being in church is a really good place to start, by the way, and we really welcome you here. But the call goes out to you too. Are you messing around with Babylon, just living for the job or the family or the money or the entertainment, the image, the possessions? Don't get caught up in all of that. And I say this as lovingly as I possibly can. Otherwise you'll miss what is so much better, the, off, the offer of forgiveness, the offer of purpose, the offer of a real relationship that will take you right to God's, hand, God's side. This, this world is just momentary, isn't it? Plenty of cultures have come and gone. Plenty of systems have come and gone around the world. The God who made this world will one day judge it. And so it calls for you and for me to realize that we need him, not the stuff. He came that we might have life. Babylon tries to mimic that and distract that. Will you say sorry for how you've been living? I certainly have been as I've been preparing uh, to share this. <coughs> Let's connect to following Jesus, the one who died for us and knows far more what is best for us. Let's commit to doing that, shall we? Let's pray. Oh Lord, once again, we are in awe of how you hold the mirror up to us. And Lord, we feel exposed that it is very easy to be caught up in Babylon. It is oh too easy for us to spend our days, our weeks, our months, and our years caring about things that will disappear one day in a flash. Lord, we pray that we will invest properly. Invest in you, invest in our relationship with you, invest our time in what you are doing, invest our, our money and what you're doing around the world and here at home. Lord, for you are the true and righteous judge. And Lord, as we search our hearts and think about the things that we might miss from this world to be with you, Lord, forgive us. For we need to realize that being with you is going to make everything here seem like rubbish. Utter, worthless rubbish in comparison to being with you. Lord, search your hearts. Forgive us, Lord. And we pray so much that you will take glory from our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. close we're going to sing two songs together and uh, please do stand and we'll sing together only a holy God this time
salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Amen. 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 Thank you folks. Have a seat. That's the end of our, our service this morning. Please uh, do help us tidy up and do join us for tea and coffee at the living room. Thank you.